This is Amal Andraus. This is Dan Wood. Um, together we are partners in WorkAC. The firm was founded in 2003 in New York. Uh, we had worked in Europe for a long time and decided to, uh, that New York was really a sort of um, an ideal city to launch a sort of international global practice. have been in the Lower East Side since the, our founding. We uh, Almost from our founding. We yeah. were in our apartment for a short, a very short time. <laughs> we try to forget about that part. <laughs> so first we were around the corner on Rivington Street um, for two or three years, and then we moved to this spot. And at first we were sharing with uh, colleagues, graphic designers, um, but we've expanded um, since and... Uh, We've also reduced. We lost a col two columns and a beam and some sprinkler pipes as the years have gone by. Yes, which was a good thing. I'm Yo, cheers to the Wonder Years. This is my toast. Oh yeah, this for y'all, all the homies at home. We like the Lower East Side a lot because it's a real neighborhood. There's a lot of activity here. Um, there's a lot of places to get lunch. And uh, but you know it's a cool it's a cool neighborhood. There aren't a lot of architects here. But it also traditionally was an immigrant neighborhood, um, and uh, um, you know typically architects were more on the west side. So it was interesting for us to to you know have a kind of more real experience uh, in New York. And since we were immigrants, we thought that was an appropriate place to start from. Yeah. And we managed to stay here 15 years so far. We'll probably make it another couple years and then... Until we get kicked out by uh, increasing uh, costs and the rent. I sound like this or that. I fucking switch it up and give them all a heart attack. And I would... I think this is a complicated time for architecture. It's both uh, very... Um, exciting um, because a lot is unknown in terms of where the field is going. Um, it's clear where it should go uh, in terms of thinking about um, cities and environment and uh, questions of density and uh, I mean everything needs to be reinvented, how we live, how we share, how we work, um, how, how the kind of urban context relates to the rural context, to kind of large swath of of, of whatever's left of nature that we need to reinvent and uh, how we live with other species, all that, all that architecture uh, can design and, and rethink. Um, but at the same time, it's complicated because uh, architecture hasn't always succeeded in reinventing um, how we live. And so we have to learn from our mistakes, but still be very, have a kind of uh, willful optimism uh, in, in wanting to change. I think that we see dealing with the climate change and the environment as one of the really big challenges, but also opportunities for architecture. Um, I think we are a little surprised how few architects are really taking up that challenge. Um, and at the same time, we can understand it because it's such a big problem and maybe people get freaked out by it. Um, but I think right now in architecture, you do see a lot of practices that are doing really great, really interesting beautiful work that maybe seems, um, you know, a little bit like fiddling while Rome burns, <laughs> to use an Italian metaphor. Yeah, um, that's a good one. Yeah, you know, and so I think it's, it's both exciting to see really great work happening and interesting thinking about architecture and space, but also kind of troubling because we really feel like let's put all that talent and you know, and let's really engage people through beauty and through design to thinking about these, these bigger issues. In general, we try to move beyond either or uh, sort of situation. So, I would say that um, our work um, both has a, more than a question of style. I think it has a, a sort of um, sensibility in terms of its ideas and 
playfulness and the kind of uh, quality of environment and experience that we like to imagine. And certainly this is something that we bring to every project, but at the same time, every project is very unique, uh, whether it's unique because of its program, its context, uh, um, its scale, um, and we like that specificity. Uh, we like to dig in to get to know more. Uh, architecture is a way for us to know more about the world and to engage others, and in that sense, I think clients are really critical um, there, we consider uh, them to be collaborators, um, and uh, and the conversation, you know, leads to always when the conversation leads to a place that nobody could imagine beforehand, then then it's successful. I think it's very difficult to maintain a super specific style these days, I think, for any architect. I think even the ones where you think, okay, they have a very strong style. If you look at the work, it is certainly changed by the context and the client. Um, and I think we fit within that. There's certainly like a lot of elements that we use and reuse and that we like to think of buildings in a certain way. Um, but I think that the question of style is, it's, yeah, not... Not uh, the most critical not so relevant. somehow. Yeah. For us. Um, but clients, and, and, you know, I think that in our early work, we certainly would have said the clients were a main inspiration and really working through the clients. But I think after about four or five years of working, we built up enough of a kind of repertoire of things that we were interested in where we could bring them to projects. So it's a mix of the yeah. two. It's always a conversation. Uh, everybody always wants to find the differences between us, but we never, He's we never. He's blonde. Gonna give it that. I'm <laughs> yeah. brown haired. <laughs> I think that um, you know we spent all morning actually talking about project types and which types of projects we're interested in in more of, and we kind of created a actually a a kind of spectrum a spectrum that, that yeah. goes from the most commercial to the most cultural. Let's yeah, say. there's a few things. One is um, architects are. Uh, one of the last kind of uh, generalist, you know, um, that, you know, bring history and uh, technology and expertise and, you know, humanities, you know, all these things together. And that's very unique and special. Uh, and so I'm not, we're not so interested in really specializing um, because I think that we believe again in a kind of cross fertilization across programs, across scales, across typologies, across contexts uh, where ideas travel and get richer um, from one, one type of project to the next. Um, and we also believe in a sort of uh, you know, sometimes the, the rule of expert is not always the best rule. <laughs> and that, you know, if you look at things with a fresh eye and with curiosity, sometimes you make discoveries that uh, you wouldn't otherwise. And so even if we've, if we, even if we have done a certain type of project uh, more than once, we try to look at it with fresh eyes always. Um, but of course we love, I mean, we, I feel lucky that we sort of love all our projects, um, and uh, we love it when there is a, a public dimension, but sometimes uh, it's about reinventing a workspace. We're a little bit nervous about the super commercial or the super developer-driven projects, although <laughs> for all developers who are out there, just ignore that last part. Yes. Um, no, but I mean, I think we and like I, we like projects that have a kind of ambition. Right? Yeah, and I think we really like we would like to work uh, at the bigger public scale, like at the scale of infrastructure. We were just talking about a project we almost got for a trash center, you know, which was literally trucks t dumping trash onto boats. Um, and I think there's a lot of really interesting possibilities in this kind of large scale infrastructural project, transportation projects.
typically we start um, by talking, the two of us, really talking to each other and sketching a little bit um, by hand. And I think that that conversation, then we bring in people from the office and involve them and kind of talk through some of the issues and think, you know, different ways that we could approach a project. And um, very quickly after that, we start building study models, like in a, in a typical project, I would say. Um, and we try to generate, you know, a lot of different options physically through models. And the models are really important to us at every stage of the process. And there's always a research part at the beginning of a project where we <clears throat> try to locate that specific project within the larger context. Like, what are the, what are the big questions that that project um, asks about? Yeah, sometimes those early conversations, right? Right, exactly. Revolve around how that particular project has been. So what are the questions the that, yeah, that we're going to bring to the project? And um, in general, I think that most people um, work on the single project uh, at a time, but... Um, we also are very horizontal in the structure, and um, sometimes if we are uh, sort of struggling with one project, we'll ask you know people to come to give ideas to critique. You know, so I think it's very important that there's a sense of openness and exchange, and where everybody can get you know give input. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the, that idea of the conversation is really central to the whole process, and in fact, the models are an important. As part, part of, of that, that because when you have a physical object in front of you, um, it's much easier to have a larger discussion where everyone is pretty sure they're looking at the same thing versus a digital representation of, of three-dimensional reality. is uh, It's still a two-dimensional representation of that, and it, that kind of conversation... One person, the person who made the digital model, has a lot more information than right. the rest of the people who are just looking at the screen, we but, find. Yeah, but uh, so what we do is we, again, we don't do a kind of either or um, in that uh, um, we use sketching, we use drawing, we use models. Drawings are really to clarify the concept, so very much 2D drawing, plan, section, uh, to sort of really distill the idea um, and, and understand what the kind of overarching diagram is. and um, But sometimes you also use drawing for uh, uh, material studies and, uh, and that we bring then to the model. So it's, again, a kind of feedback loop between all the different mediums. So Yeah, and then the physical samples come in later in the process, I would say, once the initial ideas are are there and the drawing, the production drawings are starting, then we start collecting materials. Although we always include materiality in the models very early on to have a sense of they're immediately real somehow. Dan makes a lot of models. <laughs> now everybody, I mean most people do models, but often it's also the more junior people. Um, we have a lot of interns from schools, um, um, from the US, from Europe, from the Middle East. We are deep in the hidden interior of Work AC. The heart of the office is the model shop. Uh, it's the space we spend the most time in and the least time keeping clean, I would say. Uh, so we have a laser cutter, uh, we have a foam cutter, we have boxes and boxes of materials from buttons to hair to carpeting, um, and we are always kind of testing things through the models. Um, right now we're working on a presentation model for a competition in Shanghai, which is almost finished, but we're also doing test models in here or just experimenting. I will, I will. Do you feel? How I feel, I know you love it because it's real. Well, get your sketch and think how to make it. Out of what? Uh, so you can find all kinds of materials over here, as Dan said. Uh, fabrics, buttons, we use a lot of chipboard, we use acrylic, uh, we use foam. So everything you could think of, pretty much. Um, yeah, so we figure out the material and figure out how to work with it. I mean, it's a lot of laser cutting, like I said, a lot of chipboard we like paper models, and I will say that um, acrylic probably comes in towards the mid-stage. I think we start with foam and paper, mostly, because that's the easiest um, 
kindest material to work with. <laughs> fastest. <laughs> fastest too, efficient. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's always a lot of people laughing, chatting, um, working long hours. It's a lot of smile here as well from the laser cutter, from the paint. We have a paint booth as well. We used to do chairs uh, by hand. That's but true. when you have larger office than 100 chairs for the test models, kind of overkill. <laughs> so we started to outsource it a little bit for the furniture mostly. But it's a lot by hand because I feel like while doing it by hand, you also have a freedom to experiment versus when you just go 3D print, it has to be sort of something finalized. Right. And that uh, design while testing, while doing is important for us. This is the competition uh, for the new Beirut Museum of Art in Beirut in Lebanon. Uh, we actually have quite a few projects in Lebanon and this was really an opportunity to think about uh, this amazing city and its transformation um, in the creation of really its first contemporary art museum. Um, and the idea was to um, think about how the city has changed and to think about how the city used to deal with things like the climate, uh, the very special Mediterranean air and the relationship between inside and outside. Now in Beirut, like in many cities, you have lots of big glass skyscrapers and residential buildings and commercial buildings are kind of all starting to look the same. But historically, Beirut was all about the balcony uh, and this space that was really not inside, not outside, it was shaded, but it was still uh, warmer than the inside of the house. It was the place where families would go. It was this kind of semi-public, semi-private space. The balcony was really an interesting um, connection between inside and outside, and also a place of experimentation. There are all these amazing modernist buildings from the 1960s and 1970s where the balconies become very expressive. And so the idea was to take this museum uh, and, to ta and to put 20% of the collection on the outside in this kind of series of outdoor rooms or balconies um, that both form the kind of facade but also a public experience. So the idea is that you could move around the outside of the building without necessarily going inside and that would provide a kind of art experience that would be unique for this museum. And so the balconies not only exist on the four faces, but also wrap over the top and then continue on the inside as well. So it's a kind of a building in, in, encased in, in these kind of indoor-outdoor spaces. The other idea is that these would become transformable over time. So as the museum grew, sometimes they could put glass and it could actually become indoor galleries um, or they could become part of the city. So the Arizona house is a house for a family, kind of guest house in Tubac, Arizona, which is between Tucson and Mexico. It's a high desert, so it's very hot during the day, but in the winter especially, it gets very, very cold at night. So big swings of temperature from, you know, sometimes from zero to 40 uh, within the course of 24 hours. Um, so the climate is very important, and it's also a house that's completely off-grid. So uh, the idea is that it's completely self-sustaining from water to waste uh, to energy, um, and that it is a kind of house that celebrates that performance of all those systems uh, to give its design. I'm here, I'm here, I'm no fear. It's all good, it's all good. See, baby, this is how we really work it. Stealth building uh, is, uh, uh, we were asked uh, um, by a developer to transform this beautiful um, cast iron building in Tribeca into residential uh, units and add a three-story penthouse. And because it's landmarks, it's very important for the um, penthouse not to be visible. Um, and so uh, we kind of really looked uh, at the sight lines, and so the penthouse is, uh, registers the sight lines from the street uh, and creates a very articulated uh, penthouse with a little garden in the front, but that's completely invisible from the street. And so we were able to bring 
you know, our interests of combining inside and outside and uh, kind of light and natural environments to uh, both the penthouse and the units um, um, below, which have e even a little greenhouse uh, above the shower, for example. And a lot of these ideas of kind of nature and architecture uh, came together also on the facade when we uh, uh, realized that uh, while the capitals, uh, you know, were missing, there was no information on what the Corinthian columns looked like beforehand. Um, and so we invited the architect and artist Michael Hansmeier to collaborate, and he scripted, you know, what a Corinthian column uh, might look like in the 21st century. So uh, we ended up uh, uh, sort of uh, casting a 21st century Corinthian columns out of GFRC and from afar you think they're original and old but when you get come close they're sort of totally asymmetrical and and uh, and, and uh, a little bit surreal This is a public library in Queens, New York, uh, called the Kew Gardens Hills Library. Um, it started out as an addition to an existing building, uh, and then through the course of a very long period of construction, it turned out to mostly be a new building. Um, the idea is that all the public spaces are arranged around the outside, um, and that the facade kind of lifts and lowers to kind of emphasize certain aspects, the main reading room, a little second peak where the children's area is, down privacy for the teenagers and for the back of house space here. And that also res kind of responds to the residential neighborhood. Um, it was a really long process. Evgenia Plotnikova from our office was the project architect for the last few years on this project and really saw it through to completion. It was exciting um, to see the concrete being placed, um, to see the finishes work. We did a good job on selecting the carpets and arranging them in a pattern. I did work on finalizing the furniture selection. It was really interesting to work on the client to really see their needs and trying to bring the design and the program that they give us. And um, it was interesting process because it's a city project. We worked with DDC, uh, which is a big institution or organi city organization. Yeah, manage projects for the city. Yeah, so it was also interesting from not only a design standpoint, but also construction and working with uh, city agents. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, it's a very diverse community. Um, a lot of immigrants and um, people of different income levels. Um, really interesting community that really uses the library. So in many parts of the US and probably the world, libraries are used less and less. Here in Queens, they're used more and more because oftentimes this is the only place they can go for information. There's um, programs for children in there, tax preparation, all kinds of community meetings happen in the library. Yeah, I, I have a great story actually yeah. to that question. So when we were doing the first photo shoot of the building, it was not even officially open, the building yet, but the, the construction fence was turned down. So the public could really come to the building and touch it when we were shooting. And there was uh, one girl who like touched the GFR C panels, these black ones, and she's like, whoever did this did a good job. And we are architects <laughs> standing around like, yes, thank you. <laughs> So we were invited um, to design a storefront facade for a, a parking garage in the design district in uh, Miami and as part of um, five other architects designing a kind of section of the garage um, in a sort of cadavic ski uh, concept. Um, and uh, we were given four feet uh, of depth. Um, so rather than just designing a you know, single sheet, let's say, facade, we wanted to use that space for a new kind of public, or public experience, vertical experience uh, um, that uh, brings a library, art space, uh, kids' playground, uh, uh, phone garden. charging, garden, etc., water collecting. Auditorium. Auditorium. To, I mean, a kind of hyper dense vertical uh, public promenade um, that becomes the face of the parking and creates really a new kind of public space in the in the, for the city of Miami.
PF1 stands for Public Farm One, uh, and it's an installation for MoMA at their museum called PS1, so which is public school one. Which was public school one. The installation is done every summer. It's a kind of backdrop for their parties, and the only requirements are shade, seating, and water. Um, in 2008, we thought, you know, let's bring something else to this and let, let's try to create a kind of mini piece of a utopian infrastructure for the city um, and to create a kind of urban farm bridge that combines um, fruit and vegetable growing, 51 different types of fruits and vegetables with the kind of party infrastructure of phone chargers and water and places to sit um, so it's a kind of celebration of all the things that make a city. You see, Tracy had an Xbox, me, I had a PS. Play that shit for hours just to stay up at the BS. See, people made their minds up. The Edible Schoolyard was a program started by a chef who's kind of an activist chef uh, called Alice Waters in San Francisco. And it started in San Francisco, in Berkeley. Um, and we were, Amal and I were really involved after we finished PS1 in bringing it to New York City. It started out as just a few people at this one public school and now it's a large um, kind of institution in the city that's, that's growing and, and developing more. This was the first project that we did. We took um, half of their parking lot where they used to park and created an organic garden here where the kids um, plant different fruits and vegetables throughout the year. And then this is the edible schoolyard building, which combines a greenhouse, a kitchen classroom, and then these are all the sustainable systems where the water is collected in a cistern, there's a tool shed, the HVAC, the air conditioning system, and the, and the toilet is here. And so these three systems kind of all, three parts all work together uh, to grow food in the wintertime, to cook it, uh, and it's all mixed with what the students are studying. So if they're studying art or history or mathematics or science, it's always taught through either growing or cooking food um, for three or four times a month for each student. So this was the first one in Brooklyn. Uh, the second one is in Harlem at PS7. It's a little bit different because it's addition to a school located on the second floor, so we had a big stair. Um, going to the leading to the greenhouse. There are, although, although there are elements that um, connect the two projects um, a lot, such as the colored uh, pattern shingles, which is really cool, as you can see over here on the model. Also, the circular windows is something that keeps repeating from project. Sacrifice and make them know when they say I sound like this or that. I just switch it up and give them all a heart attack. And I will, I will. Do you feel? Diane von Furstenberg's headquarters building was one of our first projects. A very early project and a great collaboration with a really amazing client. Um, it's her studio for about 200 people who work for her. It's the flagship store for her brand. It's where they test the materials. It's where she parks her car. It's where she lives uh, in her apartment. It's all kind of combined. Uh, together. Her library is the office library. She has meetings in her living room, things like that. Um, and it was within uh, two and then eventually three landmarked uh, buildings that we kind of gutted the inside and created a new building. Uh, she had gone from being just on one floor with 40 people to being on six floors with 200 people. And so the idea was to kind of create moments for the company to kind of get together and, and to interact and um, also, daylight was very important. She works with a lot of patterns and to bring natural light into the building. And so we cut this kind of shaft of light through the building, which became known as the stair de lire, which is a stair and a chandelier. And we have heliostat mirrors that track the sun and beam it down the stairs to kind of bring a natural light inside the building. Do you feel how I feel? I know you love it because it's real. And I'm here. I have no fear. Thank you for coming and uh, I hope you enjoyed the tour and we enjoyed your questions and uh, are very excited about uh, next steps. So Thank you very much.
that's where the coffee is. So people <laughs> from the, the main space coming over and chatting and making suggestions as well. So yeah, it's always exactly. a collaboration. That's true, the strategic coffee location.